Um, but just to begin, our next speaker is going to be um, Dr. Nadine Caslow. <laughs> I think our iPad is getting tired. There we go. Thank you. And uh, in the interest of time, she has a very lengthy bio here. So I'm just going to highlight what I think are the main points. She's the founder and director of the NEA Project, a professor at Emory University School of Medicine, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and the chief psychologist for the Grady Health System and vice chair of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And she has a very lengthy list of accolades here, which I'm sure you'll all recognize when she begins discussion are well-deserved, including the Elizabeth Herlock Beck Beckman Award for inspiring junior colleagues to develop pro effective programs in the community, Grady Health Foundation's Inspiring Mentor Award, Emory University's Thomas Jefferson Award, She's the recipient of multiple federal and foundation grants and has published over 300 articles and three books. And she is uh, one of our go-to people in dealing with what a lot of us deal with these days. And that's the stress of burnout in the healthcare setting. And that's going to be the topic this afternoon, beating burnout and building a culture of resilience and wellness. So welcome Dr. Caslow. Well, thank you very much. And we're going to switch gears a lot here. So I want you to sort of just put down your kind of notes that you're taking and get, I'm going to encourage you to all get in sort of a more reflective mode. This is not, it's yoga at noon time. I think that everybody has had a lot of these burnout and wellness talks that are about do good things for yourself, Here's your yoga mat, let's have yoga at noon and then you'll feel better and thank you very much. How many of you have had those talks? Yeah, all right. This is the, the problem of being short. Okay, is that better? All right, so um, yeah, so I actually think probably why people ask me to talk about this is I'm not quite as uplifting as that. So being in the hospitals during the pandemic, um, there was no way anybody working in the hospital was doing yoga at noon. Um, and so I really wanna to try to talk about a little bit more realistic approaches for you as individuals, for us as individuals, and also really, and maybe even more importantly, what, I need, what we need our organizations to be doing, because I think we need a much bigger culture change. I have no financial, um, interest to disclose. So I really want you to think about strategies for yourself and your institution and organization over this time. One of the things that I've really come to appreciate, especially over the past two years, is that what works for me may be really different than what works for you, and what works for you may be really different than what works for you. I actually don't think it matters which of these strategies you use. I don't think we have some evidence that's gonna tell you this is better than this. But it's kind of like exercise. <clears throat> when people say, well, what kind of exercise is the best to do? Well, the one you do. What kind of strategies are the best to use? The ones that you're gonna use. Okay, so if you wanna do yoga at noon, go for it. That's great, but if that's not what you're gonna be doing and what you're gonna be doing is drinking water at noon, then go for that too. So why are we even doing this now? Why have I suddenly been asked to come talk at meetings like this, when honestly, a few years ago, I never got asked to talk at meetings like this? It's because we're burned out, we're stressed out. How many of you in the room online are burned out? Raise your hand. Okay, just about everybody. The rest of you are probably lying. <laughs> And I think that there's this, I think part of the legacy of this pandemic is gonna be this sort of societal burnout. I think it's one of the sort of unfortunate uh, 
consequences, this legacy. It has strained all of our healthcare systems. It has strained all providers. We are running on empty or less than empty all the time. And, you know, giving us a mug or, you know, things like that is just, it's just not enough to fill up our cups. The pandemic waxes and wanes, but it continues and it's not going away. And we're all wearing masks in here because it's, which are uncomfortable and which burn us out more and make us more stressed out. We have Jayco coming by and yelling at people about where they keep their water when they're desperate to have water. And why should we have these rules that we used to have? Because it doesn't make any sense anymore because those rules were made for a time where we weren't wearing a mask. And then I tell you, drink some water. But Jayco tells you, oh, now your water's in the wrong place. Monkeypox is now on the scene. That has added sort of a lot to this. And then we have all our social problems. Gun violence, this has only gotten worse. Poverty, which has only gotten worse. And so we have you know, all these social challenges um, that are going on. Disparities, discrimination, bias, and social inequities are more evident than ever. The pandemic and all of the sort of tragedy and trauma that associated the time of the pandemic have put all of this into the foreground so that most people can no longer close their eyes to all of this. But it is part of what takes a toll on us all every single day. So when you have time to survey us, people are less satisfied. Healthcare professionals are less satisfied. They're less personally satisfied. They're less professionally satisfied. More and more people are saying, I don't know how much longer I can do this. I'm, I'm not sure I'm doing this anymore. I'm going to look at my finances, which of course aren't getting better. And I'm going to figure out when I can retire. I'm just not feeling satisfied with this profession, career, lifestyle that I really did love. There's more depression and there's more death by suicide. And we have more and more people concerned about colleagues who are suicidal and certainly drug overdoses as well. And there's just mounting levels of burnout. It doesn't matter what study you look at. It doesn't matter what profession you look at. The levels just go up enough. And we know that the Surgeon General really sang, um, sounded the alarm on this recently with healthcare worker burnout and beyond burnout sort of resignation. So this burnout thing is very real and it doesn't matter how we define it. I'm not gonna define it for you because you've had your lectures on what is burnout. But how do we know I'm burned out? Some examples, my team is finally getting together and I don't feel like going. For this thing I wanted to do, I don't feel like it. This is an example for me just two weeks ago. It seemed like such a hassle to Don and Duff when I go into a COVID patient's room something that was just part of what we did. And then I noticed the gowns had moved and they were now on the floor down below, lower. And I had to like bend down to get it. And I'm like, well, this is really a hassle. I was a professional ballet dancer. I have no problem bending down, but it was just like one more step. And suddenly having to tie the string, the thing in the back just seemed like too much work. I put on the COVID-19, you know, those 19 pounds, like the college 20, and they haven't come off. We've got a lot of this going on now. I just learned I got an honor and I thought, oh, well, not just because I'm humble, but because it actually doesn't really matter to me anymore. I keep making these small mistakes, don't know why, and it makes me feel badly about myself. And we all have been making a lot more of these hopefully small mistakes during this time. And then one of the other faculty members said that their example of burnout was that people stopped laughing at their jokes. Now, I don't know if that's because they became less funny because they were burned out or people were too burned out to laugh at their jokes or some combination of the two. So, just for a second, I want you to reflect on how do you know when you or someone else in your life is burned out? 
What signs, what indications do you have? Take a minute and reflect on that. And then what causes you to feel burned out? What are the kinds of things that cause you to feel burned out? Recently, our healthcare system, as many in the nation, announced that they wouldn't be giving raises this year. And I see a bunch of heads nodding because they didn't make enough money during the pandemic to give raises. So when people worked harder, feel more burned out, the prices of gas and whatever have gone up, we've given more blood, sweat, and tears. There's no money to pay us more. The number, what that did to people, the crushing blow of that will cost the institutions way more money than it would have cost them to give people some cost of living raise. They did not figure that in to their calculations, but those are the kind of system level things now that just pile on with the burnout. So in the face of this, because this is our reality, how can we be more resilient how can we be well? And I don't just mean in a superficial way. What does it mean to be resilient? It means coping well in the face of adversity and trauma and tragedy and threats and significant sources of stress, which we are encountering every single day. Wellness is when we, are, we have pretty good physical and emotional health and social functioning. You were talking about older patients with HIV, but a lot of what you said is relevant to every one of us. Not just the app, because we're older and we want to see how we're doing with our walking, but just how is our physical health? When, when we had to take our temperature at the beginning, y'all remember that take your temperature every day? Um, well, I really thought that they needed to ask people to take their emotional temperature every day. Because while well, my physical temperature never got so I couldn't go in the hospital, I am confident my emotional temperature was too high for me to walk in the hospital, but nobody kept us out for that. A positive approach to living, a process of becoming aware of and making choices. And I think part of what's happened in the past few years is people feel like they have less choices and quality and meaning in life. For me, this has probably been the thing that's been the most sustaining during the pandemic. For me personally, it was sort of stepping forward and saying, all right, I'm gonna help all of you out. What I'm gonna do is I I'm gonna help out all my ID friends. I'm gonna help out everybody in the ICUs. I don't know the first thing about what you're all doing, I actually wrote down every medical thing I learned for one year because I had a crash course in medicine with my decision to step forward to help everyone out. And why did I do it? Because it gave me a sense of meaning and purpose. I didn't get paid. I didn't really care about any accolades. I didn't, it was none of that. It was a sense of having something to do. And that if I didn't develop the skills to save people's lives, Maybe I could save the lives of people who had the skills to save lives. And so for me, if I were to pick my one wellness strategy for me, it was to be intentional about doing things that gave me a sense of meaning and purpose. And so that gets to the personal strategies. These are the kinds of slides we've seen a million times. You're supposed to unplug. Great, sure. I had a suicidal patient last night, gone to a gun range, bought a gun. I should unplug. Then he'll be dead. That would have been wise. Breathe. It's really hard to breathe through an N95. My sats drop really low when I walk the steps in an N95. I'm not the only person that has that situation. So those steps that you want me to take, well, actually, they're harder for me and lots of other people to take. Enjoy life. It's not always so enjoyable. So what can we do to balance taking care of ourselves, taking care of others, 
in taking care of our communities. Again, for each of us, this is gonna be different kinds of things. I'm not gonna walk through these. You can all read for yourself, but there are a couple of things that I wanna highlight because they're, I actually think they're personal things, but they're organizational things as well. Fresh air and sunlight. Some health systems, some organizations where people work, and certainly people who worked at home had places to get fresh air and sunlight. Other places, there is really no reasonable place to go outside. And yet people say being outside made a huge difference. So I actually think making sure that we have little gardens and things like that, we're not gonna be sitting there for an hour, but just where we can go and have some space. A comfortable chair. I am confident that most of our healthcare systems did not buy us comfortable chairs during this time. And yet we know that they made a huge difference. People who worked at home actually did a better job with the comfortable chairs. Carving out time for ourselves, using these journal prompts for sort of self-discovery and self-reflection, just like I did at the beginning of this. We've added a mindfulness moment, sort of meditation at the beginning of some of our meetings. It's amazing that if we added a mindfulness meditation, that took seven minutes, the meeting was way more productive for the rest of the time because people had a chance to just kind of settle down. I had shoulder surgery during the pandemic. And so I needed to do these shoulder exercises. And I think it was actually your group really early on now that I think about it in the pandemic. And I mentioned that. And so I had to end meetings 10 minutes early so I could do my shoulder exercises. People loved it. And so when my shoulder got better, what was their request? That I keep those 10 minutes for my shoulder exercises. And people got the same amount done in 50 minutes as they did in 60 minutes, but then they had time to do other things. Being creative, sort of noticing the negative thoughts that we have about ourselves and doing a better job communicating how we feel. I think for a long time, we all got a message that you don't communicate your feelings at work. It's not professional. It's not appropriate. I actually think that has made us a lot worse and we need to do that. We need to reach out for support and support each other. We can all tell when somebody needs to tag out and we can tag in a little bit more, but we also need to tag out too. Saying no when possible. How many of you are good at saying no? There is no hands up for that one. And that's sort of been the culture, but we pay a price. And just thinking about the times, we need to say no. There are all sorts of apps we can use now. All of you are sitting on your iPads and your phones and stuff. There are apps you can use to help organize you, track what you wanna do um, and sort of improve your mental health. I already mentioned mindfulness. It was amazing to me how many health systems paid for these apps at the beginning. And then when it was time for the app renewal, they didn't pay for the app renewal anymore. Well, people were more burned out at the second year than they were when they paid for these apps. But somehow the health system just could not pay whatever it costs for everybody to have this subscription to one of these mindfulness apps. Um, there are really good things that you can do just when you are donning and doffing, when you're walking into a patient's room, when you're sitting down that are these sort of seven second mindfulness things. You can look them up online and I actually have found them to be very helpful. Most of us are quite good at being compassionate toward everybody else. Probably most people get pretty high marks in that but most of us are not very good at being very compassionate toward ourselves. I would venture to say there's a lot of perfectionists in here and online. And if we don't do it really well, somehow we don't do it all at all. It's either a perfect 10 or it doesn't exist. And really softening our expectations of perfection on ourselves. When we're being really hard on ourselves, I didn't do that well. How did I not know what, what that was? It, it's actually better to stop 
and, and just be kinder to ourselves. And if we could all be as kind to ourselves as we are to each other and to everybody else, we would actually do a lot better. And then expressing gratitude to other people. I've really encouraged teams to at, at shift change, morning report, however your, your team functions, weekly meetings, to actually do shout outs to people for meaningful things, not just like a good job, Melanie, you did a good talk. Like that's just not that meaningful, but what was good about the talk? What did you learn about it? Sort of thanking people in a meaningful kind of way and really expressing gratitude. It's amazing how far that can go. And so consistent with this sort of perfectionism notion, really striving to be excellent and not perfect. I think excellent is much more of a journey. Perfectionism, it's like something we just fail at. Having that sense of purpose in life, I mentioned that already. And then also for those people for whom it's helpful, having a relationship with a higher power. How many of you took all of your vacation time? I love hearing myself talk. Okay. How many of you took all of your vacation time? Good for you. Oh, is that two people? Okay. I'm really going to encourage everybody to do that. When our work said they would roll over part of our vacation time to the next year, I'm like, well, what about the other part? And that's when I realized I hadn't taken days off and I am not alone at all. And really that is actually, and I know we're all going to say, but if I don't do it, it won't get done and bad things will happen, but bad things will happen if I do it and I burn out so much that I can't come and do it. And so really listening to yourself, your body and, and prioritizing nurturing those relationships. And if you're really that burned out, sometimes people really need a hard reset. They just, that's when they do need to unplug. They need to take time off. Um, and I saw all these people go on FMLA all of my colleagues went on FMLA. And then if you're on their social media, they were like in Hawaii. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Why didn't you just say you were going to Hawaii for vacation? Why, why do you need to go on FMLA? And people needed to go on FMLA for their mental health because they weren't, they somehow didn't feel like it was okay to take a vacation. That the only way they could go to Hawaii was to go on FMLA. I think this has been a really hard time for moral resilience. and We really need to cultivate our own moral resilience. So I want you to think about the strategies you've used and what other strategies might you be willing to use. But our organizations need to do things differently. Burnout is an organizational problem. And even if you did every single thing on that list, it wouldn't be sufficient. We need changes in our work culture. And those of us who are leaders have a responsibility to prevent burnout and foster resilience. And all the rest of us, because even if we're leaders, we're also not leaders, we need to make sure our organizations are doing that as well. We need good organizational hygiene. And if you notice the first thing I have on there is salary, because actually that makes a huge difference for people, as well as all the work conditions, security, and the like. Each of our organizations needs to figure out what we need because we're all different. Each of our institutions and organizations is different. And then they have all these things about what the culture is. And you know we have all these values of our culture, but somehow those culture values that flash around don't seem to be used on healthcare workers. We clearly need a more diverse and inclusive workforce. Our workloads need to be monitored. I don't think anyone's ever monitored my workload. They just like it when I fill out all these hours, but the form caps at a certain number of hours. And I'm like, well, what about the other hours I worked for the week? Nobody monitors these workloads. That, the, that our environments really need to shift much more to focus on quality and satisfaction. It seems like technology can be used to help us, but in many ways we've added technology that just makes things more complicated. We really need to engage people in collaborative decision-making. Our staff wanted a certain song play, paid every time a patient left the ICU with COVID. 
didn't matter what the song was. That's the song they wanted. What did the healthcare system do? They picked a different song and they played it at you know, 10 a.m., 2 p.m., 6 p.m. Well, that's not what any healthcare worker wanted. Why are you having a fight with the healthcare workers about a song? That's what people feel like will help do that way and, and, and use that for even more significant things. We need collaborative decision making. People need to feel like they have control and they really do need to have control. And we people need to be much more empowered and have a lot more professional autonomy. Much more of a sense of community at work. And those of us who do feel like we have a community have done better during this time. Flexibility and work-life integration. We actually saw that for a lot of people, working at home was actually a good thing. Not everybody, but for a lot of people. But if you start reading articles now, well, after Labor Day, all these organizations are forcing everybody back in the workplace. Now, some of us went to work every day. This is a moot point. But others of us didn't, or our partners didn't, or whatever it is and actually are unhappy about having to go back in. And I think what we learned is that for different people and for different things, having this flexibility can be a really good thing. We need to do a better job with rewards and incentives and our organizations need to do a better job with budgeting. We need to have wellness plans that really are meaningful and helpful. Peer support programs, there's been a lot of difficult times and having robust peer support programs can really make a difference. When I talk to people, what do they want help with at the hospital? And there's been some interesting Harvard Business Review articles about this. They want healthy food and drinks at the hospital. They want adequate sleep, place, adequate sleep and places to sleep. I had residents take me to their call room and take pictures so I could see how disgusting it was. They should have reasonable places to sleep, places to go outside, gardens, Zen rooms. If you look at places that had these things, people have done better. And encouraging and health tools, supporting health seeking and the like. Lots of access to daylight. This Harvard Business Review article really talked about these health systems that are built in. We see over here how many people chose to go outside to eat lunch as opposed to sit in here and eat lunch, just almost everybody chose to go outside where there was daylight and there's windows here and it makes a difference. And collaborative clinician spaces. We need to do a way better job addressing moral distress. There's been so much moral distress in the workplace and it's almost like, get over it. No, that was hard, get over it. Um, but, but that doesn't work and people have really struggled with, with the culture of ethical practice. I, one of the ICUs I went into, one of the COVID ICUs at the beginning of the, the pandemic, I walked in and every patient had DNI, DNR on their board, on their wall. And I called my daughter who's also an attending and said to her, there's no way every person in here, that's what they and their family want. There's just no way. It's almost like somebody, people were so burned out that this is kind of where, we landed. Well, she ended up, she has a lot of health problems in that ICU with COVID just a couple of weeks ago. And she was really thoughtful and reflective about it and sort of talked about what it was like to be in there now and how delirious some of the COVID patients were around her. And when she offered stress relief things for them or other things, Magazines said to the staff, why don't you give them some magazines? No, they didn't, they couldn't do that. Somehow, after all this time to help delirious people stuck in ICUs, no, they didn't have a plan for that. And she's like, well, I would want to be a DNI, DNR too, if I were in here and couldn't see anybody and got delirious. And it was really an interesting kind of shift in perspective. So I want you to think what your organization leader, or if you're the leader, done to prevent burnout and build a wellness culture, what else do you want them to do? And how are you going to advocate for them? We need personal and organizational strategies to mitigate burnout and foster resilience. It has to be handled as a shared responsibility. All leaders have to convey that, that providers are really valued that listen to feedback, respond to it, and integrate it in a meaningful way, share their own vulnerability, makes a big difference. Attending to strengths and 
um, of everybody. The time is now, not after this pandemic, not after the next pandemic. If you read the articles from prior pandemics and they make recommendations, they're the exact same recommendations from 1918 about what we should be doing, as I'm saying today. We haven't learned. Our well being must be taken into account in all decisions. And it is one of our most important responsibilities as leaders and our leaders' most important responsibilities, our, our well being. And we need to value and protect every one of us, have a culture that supports all of our well being, our connection, community that's inclusive, equitable, and respectful. Thank you very much and time for questions. I'm sure we'd all want to thank you for that very inspiring discussion. Um, we have a few questions, so we'll get started with our Q&A here. Um, I think, you know, you kind of built on some of these concepts at the end of your discussion here, but I think one of the things, and maybe we even talked a little bit about it over lunch, is our seeming inability as healthcare workers in a healthcare system to have any kind of influence on the leadership of our organizations. And do you have suggestions about where we can start with some of the concepts that you've conveyed to us here? So some of the, yeah, that's easier said than done. So <laughs> I, I, I think part of what's happened is we've all gotten so burned out that we sometimes aren't even taking this on. It's like, what's the point? Why bang my head against some brick wall? I think that we had a chef who donated food and cooking classes at the beginning of the pandemic. And I gave it to people in the ICU and I gave it to people here and there. And then I went to our healthcare leaders and I said, okay, we're going to do this for you all. And the CEO of our healthcare system started crying and said, no one's given me anything during this pandemic. No one's once asked me how I am. And I think that sometimes we're so want the leaders to do this, that, and the other for us that we forget that they're people too. And that this has been horrific for that. And so I think partnering with them, they want some of the same solutions that we do, assuming they're reasonable people. And I think really sitting down as a group and saying, look, we're all stressed out. This hasn't worked so well. What can we really do together? to make even a few changes that would make a huge difference. What are our top priorities? I actually think a lot of things people need don't cost very much money. I think they're worried when you come in one stuff, it's gonna cost a fortune. And I actually don't think a lot of the things that would really make a difference for people would help, would, would, would cost that much money. So I think we need to do a quit giving up and sort of go together as teams and not go in this sort of angry, hostile, like dig our heels in ready to have a fight way, but in a reasonable, like, let's try to do this. And I think reasonable leaders and reasonable leadership want, want to make this work. A lot of people in here are leaders and probably wish people would come to them more, but have gotten so tired that they sort of sheltered themselves off too. So I, that's one thing. And then the other thing is, you know, when you see something like the Harvard Business Review article that came out, send it to your leaders. Say, hey, you know, it says that if we have more of X or Y that maybe we could do here, it makes a big difference. You know, if I went to my CEO and said, hey, we would like a spa in the hospital. You know, there's evidence that if you have a spa in the hospital, it's better that they would laugh me out of whatever. That's, we're not getting a spa. But if I asked for a a garden outside I might get a garden outside. So I think sort of thinking about what we need. I think that's great advice. Um, so I'm going to take uh, editorial license and generalize the next question a little bit, um, some more specific, but I think most of us who take care of people living with HIV have a particular problem with the political situation in the country. 
um, certainly talking about treating the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community, um, transgender youth, some of the difficulties we deal with in marginalized populations, we are as healthcare providers now being demonized in our in our political system for enabling, providing, and in many cases, uh, as you know, the term grooming. Um, what? How do we approach that in sort of thinking about our own mental health and how how we deal with the the hostility? that many people have towards us in this field in particular. Yeah, so, and I, I don't envy the position a lot of you are in. So I, it, I guess what I would say is the choice I've made in my own life has been I have to be able to live with myself. And so I've made some really, really hard decisions about standing up for things that I believe in because I have to be able to live with myself. I don't believe, and all you have to do is look it up in the New York Times and you can figure out what I'm speaking about, but I took a stand about torture and Gitmo and other black sites um, with the Department of Defense. Um, and I didn't back down and I won't back down. And you know, my mom once said to me, if you knew the outcome, if you knew what would happen, given the choices you made, would you make the same decision? I said, yes. She said, why? And I said, because I can live with myself. The polit political climate comes and goes. We all see this. It is tragic what's happening right now. But I think we have a responsibility to not give up, to not let go. And to do this together, not leave one of us hanging out there somewhere. But I actually think that's what courageous leadership is. And I think the opposition is stronger maybe than we wanted to let ourselves know. We have that we know what the opposition is more now. And I think we can be more effective in standing together and firmly and strongly. But it is going to be a very long, painful, difficult fight. But we have a responsibility to, to be advocates for and with the people we are talking about. Great answer. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, there are several comments here about uh, not particularly questions, but just saying how much people appreciate your discussion, your candor, the practicality of your messages. So accolades. Um, maybe one last question before we break, and that is, um, you mentioned a few times in your talk about um, some of the apps like Headspace and Calm and some of those. How useful do you think those are? And are there specific ways you recommend that we as, as healthcare providers can best use those apps? Well, I guess what I would say how useful they are is for some people here and some of our patients are going to be really useful. And for other people, they won't be so useful. And a lot of people say they're not useful for me, but they never tried them. So I have a patient who's a fellowship director and I encouraged him to use one of those apps. And I usually tell people to pick which one. I mean, they're kind of all the same. They're just a little diff. Some people like one better. Some people like the other. I, I'm not an advertisement for any one of them. You find the one that speaks to you. So he went to work and before, um, before rounds every morning, he started doing this app for seven minutes. And after just one week, one of his fellows came to him and said, Hey ma'am, why did you have a personality change? And he said, no, I just, my therapist told me to listen to this app to, so I would chill out before rounds in the morning. And so he now opens his door at 7.45 in the morning, gives people five minutes to come in. At 7.50, he turns down, but not off the lights, turns on the app for seven minutes, and anybody who's going to go on rounds can come in and do the app together. They do it. They chill. 
and they say it's totally changed how they round. I encourage teams to do that. It changes shift. I encourage them to do it in the middle of a really bad shift. When, you know, I think if you, I really encourage everybody to take a moment of silence, a literal moment of silence at the bedside when someone dies, when anyone dies. And I think sometimes after that, we all hear, oh, you just got to keep going. There's the next patient and the next patient. They're going to be there. 60 seconds is just that. It's 60 seconds. And you need to go to the restroom. I would say you're feeling stressed out right now. Go to the restroom, stick on your earbuds and use an app for seven minutes. Somebody knows what you're doing. And, and I think for a lot of people, they're, they're not going to save your life. But I think if you just need to kind of push pause for a little bit, it gives you a little structure to help you be more mindful, more aware. Or some of the ones like if you've got a little ADD, the organization ones may change your life. So, I mean, what's, it's going to be different for different it's going to be different for different people. I notice when I'm more stressed out and doing a million things, I'm less likely to use it. So when I need it more, I use it less. And I think people who really do a good job, we have a lot of people that sit in our parking lot every morning and you can say, see them that they're there for seven minutes sitting there. And you know, they left their kids and their whatever, and they're coming here and they're chilling before they go to work. Highly recommend it. Great. Well, I think that's all the time we have for Q&A. We have built into the schedule a 15-minute break, but again, I think I'm going to take some editorial license and give everybody just a, a chance to get up and stretch, use the restrooms or facilities, and come back in, in five to 10 minutes so that we can get started with what I hope will be a really fun panel with some great speakers uh, for the last part of our session today. So. Thank you very much, Dr. Kasler.